Lombardi <laughs> is a brilliant writer and producer. She is the, one of the key creative forces between, behind some of, I think, all of our favorite work, including Buffy the Vampire Slayer, including Mad Men, including Unreal, and now she's working on a new show for AMC called Dietland. Um, and so excited to have her here. Jamila Jamil is an actress who is, you know, best for The Good Place. It's actually her first acting gig, but she <laughs> has been an incredible host and uh, presenter for a long career before that. And she's also the founder of a social movement called iWay, where she's really encouraging women to collaborate, to really see themselves differently in a more positive light. And it's really a meaningful piece of the kind of change that we want to talk about here today. And then Amanda Brugel is someone you probably know best as Rita, the Martha in Offred's home um, on The Handmaid's Tale. She's also an amazing creative force and someone who is an advocate of women, an advocate of mentorship, and just incredibly articulate. So let's give them a warm welcome. Um, so I want to talk about a lot of stuff. I feel like I had the best prep calls with these women, so it's hard to know where to start. I want to talk about collaboration <laughs> among women, first and foremost, because I think that we talk about change happening. We talk about... Um, you know, we talk about Me Too, we talk about Time's Up, we talk about collective bargaining power, which is such an age-old idea. Um, but that all requires people to come together. Um, and I'm really curious how you think about collaborating with other women. I'd he love to hear from all of you guys. Marty, do you want to start? Uh, <laughs> gosh, um, I think that what you said is how do I feel about collaborating with other women and collective bargaining power. I heard that also. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, in truth, you know, I, I created, um, I did not create Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I, I helped run that show um, with Joss Whedon. Um, and to be honest, like that was an incredibly fruitful um, collaboration. You know, he's, he's a better feminist than I am. Um, uh, I didn't get to go to Wesleyan, you guys, like he did. Um, but, um, but in general, collaborating with women has been, you know, has created some of the best experiences of my creative life. Like I, I um, created a show on um, Bravo called Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce, and I was able. I love that. <laughs> I love that show. Would you guys tell? Would you guys tell people that you like that show? Because, <laughs> because um, I created it for for people to enjoy, not necessarily for critics to enjoy. Because I felt like. Um, what, what we're not seeing enough of, and this only four or five years ago, saying the word divorce was not cool. Like, and it really was, I'd, I'd go into meetings with men and pitch the show and they'd be like, ooh, that's scary. If my wife watches that, she might think of divorcing me. I'd be like, yes, that's the plan. You know, this is a sneaky show. Um, but my point being, um, uh, you know, it was very hard to get that show made. But once we did, the collaboration with women like Lisa Edelstein, Retta, um, Alana Eubach, um, Nikar, um, they were, it was one of the best experiences until we got to Dietland, where this time not only did we get to put women um, on the show, we had a female DP, we had all female producers on the ground, we had primarily female directors. And believe me, guys, if I could have done that before, I would have. I tried. Um, and we kicked ass. We kicked ass. So um, I think, you know, be, we should need to seize this moment um, when people are properly afraid of us and, and no. continue. <laughs> Seriously, like, I don't know how long guys are going to be scared of us, so we got to get in there um, mm -hmm. before they go back to being like, eh. Is it, are you done yet? Are you ladies done yet? <laughs> Complaining. Moment's done. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, me. One of, yes. Yeah, everyone. <laughs> um, I love collaborating with women. I haven't had much of an opportunity to in my career because I started 10 years ago where I was, there were no women ever on writing teams. It took me one year working on a show that I was working on when I was 24 years old to get one woman on a writing team of eight men because the men would tell me that I wasn't funny because I was a girl. And so I should just stand there and look fashionable rather than uh, ever try to join in on the comedy sketches. And so I campaigned for a year to get the network, to get one female writer. 
And I, to this very day, don't even know if she spoke English because I never heard her speak because they found someone who was so quiet and subservient and intimidated by them that she never contributed in the meetings, which was such a manipulative thing to do. And then uh, the one or two times they let me, after harassing them, uh, do a comedy sketch, they deliberately gave me the shittest material you've ever <laughs> seen in your life. No one could have made that funny. Just in order to kind of trip me up and prove to me, break my confidence, and say to the network, she can't do any comedy. Um, I'm now on a comedy in America. <laughs> uh, but the point is, is that I am now finally working with female directors and female writers. Mike Schur has a 50-50 writing room, which is so inspiring, and I've never been an experience like that before. And it changes the way you feel. You feel safe. We feel supported by each other. There's a for the first time in so long, there's a feeling of solidarity amongst women where we don't feel like we're all just competing for one spot. We're all in this together, and especially with the uprising of Me Too and Time's Up, there's more of a sense of sisterhood. We've spoken about it before, but for the first time ever, I can really feel it around me. And, um, and I only hope for it to grow and for us to lose that sense of panic and gratitude for being in rooms that men feel entitled to be in and we support each other and hold each other up. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing this for 20 years, and so it was uh, this similar 10 years ago, five years ago even. It just wasn't a common thing to be in a room with a lot of women behind the camera. And I'm Canadian, I'm from Toronto, and uh, it, the first time I was really on a set that was predominantly women was The Handmaid's Tale. And it, it was unbelievable how I had been trained to believe a narrative that women working together, it, it just, we wouldn't produce anything of value. <laughs> produce the best show in the world, so thank you. But we <laughs> wouldn't produce. <laughs> but, but wouldn't produce anything of value because we were catty and we were out to get each other. And not that I personally believe the narrative, but when you're first in a room with a group of women and it's not something that you experience frequently, you're, you're scared. Not scared, but you, you, want to, you want to get it right, you want to do it right, you want to prove people wrong, you want to make sure that you work well together. And within three minutes, all of those, that previous narrative have gone out the window and I was like, I can't believe we haven't been doing this from the beginning of time. It is the most quiet set. Reed Morano was at the helm, Reed Morano was directing. Elizabeth Moss was a producer last year, she's an executive producer now. A lot of my scenes are involved with a lot of women in the show and it is so laser focused and quiet. We are so supportive of one another. Not that the men aren't, it's just a sisterhood that is so powerful and there's an electricity in the air when it's all women. I feel like sometimes all of us, like in this room right now, there's an electricity. There's a lot of time with women, we don't even have to speak to one another. We can sort of just feel where each other is at. There's this inherent um, empathy that comes along with it. And this is show business, yes, but when you're in a creative capacity, you need that kind of empathy to get the best product. Mm -hmm. So I love this. I want more women to be behind the camera and in front of the camera. And I agree with you that I think that we need to seize the moment now and prove that we can continue to make the most amazing product, it being mostly women. Big Little Lies. Hi. So good. Mostly yeah. women. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So I will good. say, like, cool. it's a good a, thing to be healthy. Additional thought to that is just, to me, though, like, the next, I can't wait for the whatever wave it's going to be, like 10 or 15, when we don't have to be better than everybody else and quieter and more focused. And, you know, the... the fucking the, thinner. Fucking thinner. And, <laughs> you know, I'm 53, and this, this idea that getting older is also, um, you know... It, it may, I mean, I was already invisible at, like, 35, you know, <laughs> according to culture. Now that my vagina's a tumbleweed, it's like it's yeah. over, right? <laughs> You know, I'm supposed do you not, to be... <laughs> do you not find it's getting better, though? I mean, I'm 41, and yeah. I've Fuck found... Off. No, you're not. Girl, I am. <laughs> I'm 41. <laughs> <laughs> but I found, I found, I think, uh, like, with the, the Me Too movement and with trailblazers and women that have come before me, I find that it's getting easier. It's not getting better. But I do find that 40 now isn't the same as it was 
three years ago. Can I say something potentially inflammatory, which is, but that's because you're beautiful. Um, I think that if you, if you, if, if, at least my experience in the business is if you're not pleasing to the men who give us jobs in visually, if you don't keep up. I hear you. Yeah. Thank then, you for saying I was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, you are. <laughs> I mean, this but, whole thing is ridiculous. But um, no, but I hear you. Yeah. I, hear you. I wonder if I wonder if aging, if we were all aging, um, you know, uh, like most people do who don't have money and the advantages, you know, that we all have. Yeah. Um, if we'd be experiencing quite so much acceptance. Yep. So. I, I agree. Yeah. Also, I'm so tired of seeing 60-year-old men with 30-year-old wives, <laughs> and it doesn't get <laughs> referenced in the film at any point. But if you have a woman with a man who's 15 years younger than her, that's the title of the film, and the whole film is about <laughs> this like weird, <laughs> sick, pervert relationship. Uh, and, and yet Woody Harrelson, what, how old was his wife in, in uh, Billboards? Like, just very young yeah. and that's just it's and that's the trend throughout the whole of Hollywood that I remember uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal at 37 tweeting that she had been told she was too old to play a 54 year old's wife what is the <laughs> subliminal messaging for us that yeah. we have we have failed by surviving like yeah. we are how dare we <laughs> live how dare we live long how dare we laugh and then have lines that look like we've laughed like yeah. if a man gets older and he gets salt and pepper in his hair it's like sexy and dignified and he's clooney and we're just some like old bitch who should go and hide in case we scare yeah. all the penises yeah. like i don't understand yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm fully with you i think i think men i think men yeah. call that their success fat they're uh -huh. like this is just made of money you know, and with ladies, it's a failure. It's like, yeah, yeah. anyway, we could go, oh, we could go yeah. on. <laughs> Sorry. No, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I, I, the, thing, the, the things you're talking about, though, like, these are so, the things you're talking about are so ingrained in, like, what we think and how we work and, like, how men treat us. And I think, like, what I'm curious about is, like, I feel positive that there are headlines about, you know, women like challenging power structures. I feel positive that, you know, 50 to 100 women had to come forward to, you know, Harvey Weinstein or to get like a guilty verdict in the Cosby case, right? It's like, it's one woman still isn't believed, like, but like how, like, how do we make change from here? Like how do we turn this thing that I think could be a movement but isn't yet into something that like we're feeding into? Like how are we addressing everything we're talking about and like making, actual change from here. Oh my gosh. I think it, I do think it is a definitely it is a movement, but I think that what's I think it starts not only with ourselves, like learning how to love ourselves in spite of everything society tells us definitely not to. Uh, stepping away from the self-hatred that we are, that, uh, that is like poured into us from the minute that we're born. I think the next step after learning how to accept and love ourselves, which makes us stronger, is then remembering to support each other. Because sometimes we say we do, but we don't because there is an inherent sense of competition in us, which is, again, instilled in us by the patriarchy. We have to learn how to actually build each other up, help each other. I have had women that I have worked with sometimes get angry with me for standing up for myself mm. on set, for standing up for writers, standing up to directors, standing up to makeup artists. You know, it's, uh, they get angry with me and start to become mean to me because they are what I, I think what I, upset them with is a sense that I remind them that they didn't speak up for themselves and they feel annoyed with me for like, like just changing anything up, get, putting anything else into the mix. I think we need to stop that. We need to challenge each other and we need to push each other to speak up. We need to speak up with one another. We really, really need a stronger sense of sisterhood. And I think that becomes harder and harder with social media and all the different things that make us hate ourselves that then make us hate each other. I think that is so important because we are almost... I believe the patriarchy wants to divide us in order to conquer us. And it pits us against each other, and it gives us more and more fucking ridiculous ideals to live up to. If you look at the fact that every time we move forward in a generation, I think it was Kate Beckinsale who pointed this out, that every time we step forward as a, 
every generation that moves forward, our body ideals become even more ridiculous to uh, <laughs> achieve. So before, in the 90s, we all had to be anorexic, and now we have to be anorexic, but with big asses, but no thighs, and big tits, <laughs> but no fucking arms, uh, and uh, we have to be ageless forever. So we all have to look like a teenage sex doll um, because we're getting into the boardrooms, and we're becoming directors, and we're winning Oscars, and we're writing great things, you know. We're moving too fast, so they're trying to distract us. It's literally like a game of diversion where they're taking our eye off the ball. We need to step away from that. We need to encourage each other to step away from this shit. When your friends are being negative about their looks, you've got to make sure or about themselves at work or about their position or whether or not they should ask for a raise. Boost each other up. It's so, so important. And it's the only way we're going to win. I... I want to talk about, Marty, you've been very vocal, um, and I think you did this in a way where you really controlled your own narrative um, with like, the way you support and you show up for other women. So I'm talking specifically about, you know, Kater Gordon was talking about her experience on Mad Men, um, and you very vocally said, I worked on that set, I was a senior woman or, um, in that room, and yeah. I believe her, and this is yeah. likely what happened, and you said it in a way that was yours. Like, what responsibility do you feel that women have to to believe each other. Well, it's interesting, you know, even as you start to talk about it, like I feel my heart rate start yeah. to go up, like, uh oh, oh God, here we go. And, um, and I think that that is so important when, uh, you know, there are outlier situations. I've, I've known people who've been in them where they were falsely accused. It does happen. It is the outlier. It is not the norm. Um, the fact that people go to that as the norm has everything to do with their fear of things changing. Um, it's really frightening to have this much change going on at, at, at all at once. You know, a, a, as human animals, we're not, um, we're not designed for this much change. It's really scary. So people, even if a woman is in a situation that is horrible, it, it's almost un inconceivable to many of us that it could be different, you know? And um, so the fact that Cater came forward and publicly, you know, because believe me, there were things that happened there that, that people would have reported if they didn't think their careers would be over. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, there's so much about Matt that I respect and admire, but he's the kind of person where you didn't know what was true and what wasn't true. So a joke, like you owe it to me to show, your, show me your body naked, to a 25-year-old woman who had just worked her way into the business may not be a joke. And I know that it happened because I was there. And I can't tell, you know, and she came forward publicly. And I, I'm telling the truth when I got a number of calls from other people saying, what are you going to say? Because I was the only one with enough seniority to survive an attack by Matt Weiner. Um, they, we all fought. And so the onus was on me. Now I have friends who are friends with him. I, you know, I have close people to say that. I sweated the decision to back someone up so hard. It was so frightening. There were so many hours of therapy spent on should I or shouldn't I. So can you imagine me, who should be pretty bulletproof, having to go through that to say, yes, I believe you. And then, so what courage did it take for Cater to say the thing in the first place? And the environment that we worked in, I did have a number of people come to me and say afterwards, like, you know better, it's just how it is. Mm. And my, my message back to them is, it's how it was, and it shouldn't be that way. And if I'm a woman and I treat people poorly, I shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. You know, nobody should be able to create a workplace that is so hostile that people are vomiting in the bathroom or terrified that if they say something wrong and get fired that then their reputation is going to be smeared all over town. It's very easy for men to say just quit because they can find another job. You know, I had a situation, uh, you know, and, and the other thing is we were never sure if we were invited back. It was always kept very nebulous. And I don't think a lot of this was intentional. It was just the environment. So you really did think, well, maybe it's the thing I said that will not get, it had nothing to do with talent. You were, talent was like taken off a table. And so I'm saying, I, I guess I, if it was that frightening for me, it's hard to believe that anybody would want to do it for fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. you know, or for attention. Those very few outlier people are not the people who are coming to the press and saying, this fucking happened. So I felt an obligation. To me, the definition of bravery is not um, stepping forward when, when, when it's safe. The definition of bravery is stand, stepping forward when you, there will be a cost to you. And I was recognizing that there, there has to be a cost for us, you know, for those... And there have been, let's put this in context too, women of color have been doing this for centuries, and women have been doing this for each other for centuries. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I did anything that I haven't seen modeled by Rosa Parks, by, you know, by, by, you know, the women who worked with Cesar Chavez, you know, whose names I don't even know because fucking they were not recorded. You know what I'm saying? Like, this has been going on forever, but, but when you have some power, which I do because I worked my way into this position, you know, it is on us, the onus is on us to step forward and be brave, you know? And really, what's the cost, you know? Some people aren't gonna talk to me. Maybe I don't wanna talk to them anymore, you know? The more women we have in power, yes, absolutely. The more women we have in power at the top, the less likely all of these things are to happen. And we have to push ourselves and we have to not be afraid to ask for what it is that we deserve. And we have to ask for more money when we deserve more money. And we have to be bossy and we have to be difficult. Like, I'm not rude to anyone ever, but I am uh, very firm with my beliefs and where I stand. And it took a lot of bullying, being bullied uh, in order to finally stand up for myself because no one else would stand up for me. Uh, we have to do this and then we have to progress and we have to do it for the next gen. We have to not just do it for ourselves, we have to do it for our daughters, for their daughters. Like we have to rise to the top so that we can protect the others because otherwise we're just vulnerable. Yeah. Although one, uh, one quick addendum, because I've been working, trying to get into the business since I was very young, you know, worked as an assistant, worked my way up, got that first job, you know. Um, you also have to be really careful about picking your moments, um, you know, and picking your battles because unfortunately, at least in my experience in Hollywood, um, was that first you get, you have to build to the place of stat, and I hope that it changes, but, you, but you, I think we're still a little bit here where you have to decide which battles are worth fighting and which, to, it's sort of like raising children, right? Like you can't just be like, don't, wait, stop, don't, I, I, you know, you find that moment because what, then when you get to the place where you can turn around and say like, you really can't hurt me anymore because I can, I have money, dollar, dollar, dollar um, value and vote power. We have dollar power and vote power. And in a lot of workplaces, you don't have vote power. So you got to kind of build up your dollar power. And once you've got j just enough, then, then it is, and I'm not saying, I'm just trying to be realistic in terms of building a business, um, that you have to play that game a little bit until you get to the place where you can say, otherwise, at least in my experience, eventually they'll find a reason to fire you or marginalize you. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if that... I think, I think it's... I see what you're saying, and I'm not saying go in and just be like, I want a million pounds right now when you've just come straight out of university. I'm just saying that make sure that internally you value yourself. People can yes. sense a lack of value in a room. Yes. They can smell our fear. They can smell our sense of like gratitude to be there and like fear of what they'll think about us and fear of, ju fear of judgment. There is a certain sturdiness that you have. Yes. It can even be in the way that you sit or the way that you carry yourself, the way that you dress. Um, I've started enjoying sitting like this lately. <laughs> Not in dresses, but it's like, you know, I'm in a birthing situation, but there's just tiny little things yeah. that, can, that can project onto someone else that you feel strong and safe and sure about yourself. And That's I think great. those are good things to adopt and learn, and they will make someone inherently slightly fear you and respect you, I think. That's, um, I, there's so much I want to follow. I'll close my there. legs. I'll close my legs. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Yeah, cool. um, but I think... The thing about money, about having power that comes with yeah. money is so meaningful. And I think I'm curious if any, all, some of you feel like you have the negotiating power to ask to be paid at parity with your male coworkers. Because I 
so often hear from women who have made it really far that when that word comes up, people are like, we're going to move on if you say that again. Like, the word parity is like a dirty word in these negotiating situations. So No, I don't. You don't have it. No. Not, no. Yeah. No. I don't know very many women that do feel they have that power. I mean, look at the example of all the money in the world. I'm sure that um, the, the situation with um, Michelle... Williams. Williams. I, I'm sure that she, if she were to be sitting here, if she was asked the question, she would have probably assumed that she had some sort of power, a modicum of power, and wouldn't have anticipated that her co-star would be, a, be being paid a thousand times more than she was being paid. No, I don't, I don't feel like I have that power. I also, I, I am hoping that these kind of conversations that open up um, and conversations together in the back rooms and conversations out at dinners together help us move in that direction, but I don't think that we're close. Not to be negative, but I want to be realistic and um, not put a veil over the idea that just because we brought it up means that we're there means that we've achieved it. We're not there. We're not close to being there. We're close to, um, we're close to building a rally like this and we're close to having louder voices so people start to believe us, but um, it's going to take some time. There's still a lot of uh, older people that do hold power, both men and I do think women, that don't believe and are a little threatened by the idea that women should be making equal and so they want to keep it at status quo. Um, my biggest thing in these types of talks is I really, really like to come up with um, hard examples of what to do and how to do it. I love saying stuff like we need to rise up and we need to use our voices, but that's not really anything tangible or concrete to do. It's difficult to have people go forward then and realize what to do. Uh, I do think that um, if you want something to do, you can constantly write your agents. Uh, you can talk to, <laughs> talk to your male producers to their face, not in a harsh way, but in a firm way. Um, instead of retweeting or putting hashtag, hashtag girl power, hashtag rise up, <laughs> hashtag let's get paid the same, boo. No, have a conversation face to face with someone. Um, so I think that the more that we do that, the more that we actually have conversations with the people that are in power and conversations with each other, active conversations and not just hashtag, hashtagging and retweeting, that's when I think the ball will start rolling. Yeah. Um, I, I like asking uh, men that I work with who are at the same level as me. I don't believe that I should earn as much as like, someone who's much more experienced. For example, I don't think I should be on the same salary as Ted Danson, who was in Cheers, which was before I was born. <laughs> yeah. a very long, amazing career, and he does draw in a certain crowd. No one knows who I am. But the people who are at the same level that I am, where it's their first big gig, I love to ask people, I love to ask men yeah. how much they're earning. Yeah. And I think it's very important um, when it comes down to the specifics to not feel embarrassed about asking someone a question that they should feel very comfortable in telling you the answer to and putting a tiny bit of pressure on the men who are your peers to make sure that they are on your side. Like, there's nothing wrong with educating men. We're not, we don't have to be in a war of men versus women. There is a way of making men empathetic towards us. And not all men, obviously, some are, you know, it's beyond help, um, but there are some, <laughs> but, but your coworkers, the men who should be on your side, make sure that they are on your side. And don't, if you feel embarrassed to ask these questions, then people are going to sense that and they're going to allow you to feel that completely needless embarrassment. So I like to ask men how much they're earning. And I just this year, and I think I credit the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement for this, but um, I just signed a, sh a new show um, that I'll also be doing. And uh, I walked away from the job three times until they paid me what I believed I was worth. And I really, yeah. really didn't... Yeah. Um, I really, really, really wanted to do the show, so I felt <laughs> sick, uh, and I've never peed that often in my entire life, just out of pure nerves as to what I was doing. I was shaking as I would put down the phone, but I knew that if I, if I don't stand up for myself, even though I am a newcomer in America, I knew I could do that job. I have 10 years of experience in that job, just as much as the other people who do that job, and I knew that if I didn't value myself now, they sure as shit weren't going to. They weren't going to give me money that could be spent on their own holidays. And so I do, I do, it's a risky thing to do. It's a huge risk for me. I could easily have not gotten the job. But what if I hadn't tried? What if I hadn't said no three times? Yeah. I'd be earning. Thank you. <laughs> so I agree. It is practical. 
we need to be practical about all of these things. And yeah, and, that's, and that is the, the balance, is like also assessing how much you can afford to lose. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a lot of the things that I, you know, again, like you talk about bravery, I could, af I could afford to lose everything at that point. So I could afford to be brave, too. Like, I don't fault people who are in a situation economically where they're like, I can't yeah. step forward. I yeah. can't. Because if I do... You know, I'm done. I'm mean, like, I, I'm like, I, you know, I checked my bank account. I'm like, I can afford to never work again. It would be awful price to pay for just saying what I believe. But that's how frightened we have been made to feel. Yeah, I it's think all an it's, it's you know, all it's an illusion. You know, it's that's an amazing thing about the last couple of years is I don't know how about many of you feel like I'm still every day going like, oh wow, that is fucked up. Yeah, like, every day. I just constantly look at stuff that I saw yeah. as quote unquote normal and I'll go like, wait, it's really okay, so yesterday Bill Cosby got sent to fucking jail, which is rad, and 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 you know, Trump is doing this and North Korea's doing that and trending is that this woman's eyeliner fucking stayed on. Like that's <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> that shouldn't be normal that she had a car accident and her fucking eyeliner stayed on. Like, okay, g do you guys know what I'm talking about? It was a trending thing on Twitter. And I was like, that's, you know, but a, a few years ago, I would have been like, silly lady with her hair. You know, now I'm like, oh, that's, that is it. That we're so worried that our eyes are going to look less glamorous that we think that it's really notable that we had a car accident and it stayed on. <laughs> what are we telling our daughters when we retweet stuff like this and we think it's funny? Like, it's, it has been this incredible, like, awakening and how this is all relevant to how you do your business is. And I think, you know, we're all saying it in, in a weird way. Like, what I have found is that the, the deeper that I dig into my truth and the ugliness about the things I feel about myself and other people, and the more I tell on myself, like you were telling the story that you told at TCA about it's about poo, about poo, about a very cool. Uh, Glad you brought it up now again. Yeah, <laughs> I won't make you tell the story, <laughs> yeah. but um, but those things are so universal, and and that's why people connected to Buffy, and that's why they connect to Girlfriend's Guide, because those stories are all things that either happen to me or Joss or one of the other writers on the show or another writer who was going through a divorce, they're all, it's like, don't ever think that, that you're the only one who's made a, a Tampax out of rolled up toilet paper. You're not. <laughs> That's an example. <laughs> so, I guess the question then is like talking like to specifics and like how do we like let everyone who's here today also feel like they're getting something that they can walk away with and do today. Like I'd love to hear, I mean I think first I'd love to hear like how you guys all have power now. You have success and I think there's always like more to like climb and like to desire but like how do you employ that power in service of other women today? Oh my God, there's three questions in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have power now really because I've learned kind of well how to achieve balance. And I found that earlier on in my career, a win, it, would, it, was, it was good, but just focusing just one thing on the win and one thing on your career, um, it's a bit lonely. I have two children, I'm the mother of two young children, and celebrating the wins in my career now and then being able to drop that, leave that, because that's not what solely it makes up me, what solely defines me as successful, and then being able to focus on my family and then being able to celebrate them has fully put me in my power now as a 41-year-old woman because I do feel that I'm more like a well-rounded person instead of trying every day my intention and my goal being about getting a job or looking pretty or looking good. I still want to get a job, but the balance and trying to achieve balance and harmony in my life has enabled me to really stand in myself, knowing that if my career were to fall apart, that I have my family. Or knowing if my children are driving me crazy and I don't want to see their faces, then I can go out the door and I can go out of my job. And that really is giving me power. Um, as far as specifics and going forward and what to do, I love, like I love a list and I love a task. Um, so I did this with a girlfriend of mine because I read it on uh, Oprah.com and I did it last year because I just found, not unlike you were saying, it's so ingrained and it's taught. We're, we're taught to 
be suspicious of one another, women as a whole. And just little subliminal messages, even in lovely cartoons like Frozen and Disney Adventures. Um, women are taught to suspect each other and throw shade at each other and not support each other. It's so inherent in us. So I challenge every woman in, in this room, because it was a really, really neat exercise, for 14 days to find one woman and lift her up, whether that be in a compliment, it could be a stranger, it could be your mother, it could be your sister, it could be your best friend, but give her a compliment and tell her why you love her. The stranger, that might be creepy, but don't worry about it. <laughs> it'll, it'll work out. But the first couple of days, you might feel self-conscious, but what it does is it gives you purpose and intention for that day to actively seek another woman and lift her up. And once you're done, It's, once the 14 days are over, it's, it's, you, you feel a little lost because going for, for two weeks lifting other women up, it, you, it becomes contagious in your life and you find it something naturally that you want to do always. And it really, really changes the way you shift going through the world because you actively seek other women throughout the day to, ooh, I can't wait to tell a girl I like her shoes. Or <laughs> I, I, I had a, a teacher and she really made me feel good about herself. Or I see a single mother on the road and I'm telling her that I, she's mm. doing a good job. And if we start doing that as a collective, I really think think it'll become contagious and it's something that we will with intention go out and do with each other. So try it. That's amazing. I <laughs> um, hope everyone does that yeah. today. 14 uh, days though. Yeah. Starting today. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to start today. Uh, mostly by telling you that I loved that. that was uh, my first thing. See, that's good. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Um, so uh, why are there so many male rappers uh, all singing about murdering pussies and drugs and guns and everything else. Uh, why are there so many of them? And they all feel like they've all got their own little space, but there can only be one female rapper at a time. And when another female rapper comes up, the queen has to destroy yeah. the other one. Like, why, why do we always just get one of a woman and then hundreds of the bloody men? Like, <laughs> this is another part, just going along with what you were saying, this like sense of like, there's only space for one. There's all the space in the world. They just don't, men. The patriarchy, they don't want us to believe that. But we have all the space, and because we're trained to be as like small and Weak. skinny and take up yeah. as little of their space <laughs> as possible, uh, it's just all bullshit. There's space for all of us, and we just have to create that space, not just for ourselves, but also for each other. It is so important. But I think, like I said at the beginning, love, learning how to love yourself is the first step of that. And it sounds selfish, but it's so important because once you are put together, you are stronger and you are stronger to help other women and further yourself. So there are so many toxins in the world now. We have magazines, we have Hollywood, we have all the stereotypes that we see. Fucking Insta fucking gram. Oh my <laughs> God. Hitting explore on Instagram feels like going into the wild west of my self-confidence. Like, yeah. I have no idea how I'm going to feel afterwards. Like, unfollow accounts that you find triggering and that you find toxic to yourself. I just, it's, I call it the fuck shit detox of just, like, <laughs> detox your brain. Remove toxins from your life. People around you who make you feel bad about yourself that you can avoid. Members of your family that you need to confront and tell them how they make you feel things on social media that make you feel bad about yourself, magazines that you read or that you follow online that tell you things that make you spend way too much time thinking about your exterior and nowhere near enough time thinking about your job, your career, your soul, your family, your happiness. All of these things are so important for us to do as a collective, as you were saying, but detox yourself. Get rid of all the toxins in your life that chip away at your womanhood, at your sense of self. That's something that I decided to do at 29. Uh, at 29, I was told uh, when I was thinking about leaving England that I was too old, mm -hmm. too ethnic, and too fat to come to America and try to have a career here. In the time since, I have not lost any weight. I'm older, for sure, <laughs> and I've been in the sun, so I'm darker skinned, mm -hmm. and I'm having a great time, and I've got jobs, and I didn't listen to them, and I did succeed because these were invisible monsters put around me of just like fear mongering. I have also unfollowed anyone on social media that makes me feel bad about myself. I don't follow magazines that teach me to focus on my exterior rather than my interior, and I've told members of my family even to fuck off when they have made me feel bad about myself. <laughs> I've gotten rid of bad men, 
around my life, and I've told female friends who make me feel bad about myself or feel competitive with me also to either get therapy or remove themselves from my periphery. I now have a clean existence, <laughs> and I cannot recommend that highly enough for just mental health and also physical well-being. That's my opinion. <laughs> Um, I had a thought, I agree, I mean, I used to hate it so much when people would say, before you can love anybody else, you have to love yourself. Because I'd be like, first of all, wanting to be loved is a, is a primal need. Wanting to be touched and in a relationship with another being, you know, these are things that everybody wants. Like, stop fucking telling me not to want it, to get it. Like, that seems really hard. Um, and, and and impossible. Um, but what I have discovered, you know, over the low these many years is um, for me, like, just val what you said, valuing myself. Mm. Um, just all of val yourself. Valuing myself. And, and exactly, meaning that also means the parts that suck. And there are parts that suck of me and, and all of us. And I think there, there's also this idea, like nothing makes me feel worse than reading a self-help magazine or book because I'm like, I'm gonna fail at this too. Here's, the, all those books should just be called Another Way for You to Fail. <laughs> because I'm not ever gonna do any of this perfectly the way the way you get to this, I think, real sense of value is when you go like, yeah, parts of me suck, parts of me are great. But I, I, to me, like the whole Me Too moment, hopefully what we can earn by this is that women are also human beings. We have all the qualities of a human being. We have good things and bad things, just yes. like other human beings. We are actually human, just like other people. <laughs> we also make human beings. Oh, and like, we do that. <laughs> we so we're actually better bodies, than some human And then beings. we feed them <laughs> with our bodies. Like, yeah. Yeah. We, men only exist because we fucking put them here. We push them out, <laughs> like literally push them out of a very small hole. It's a small, painful experience. Exactly. Like, what, how can anyone devalue one half of the world who is responsible for creating them? We, are, we build them with our own cells in our body. Yeah. It is so insane that we've been made to feel devalued. How has this happened? We are the generation that because of the internet and because of the movements and because of the fact that we can communicate with each other who can change this. Yeah. And I think it's... It's really exciting. Yeah, to be a part of it is. It's, yeah. it's, it's miraculous, but it's also terrifying. Yes. Yeah. So scary. <laughs> I feel I will probably it's never exciting. have sex again, but that's okay, because <laughs> vagina, <laughs> tumbleweed, it's fine. <laughs> I made my children. I'm good. You're all set. <laughs> um, I think there is like something really amazing about this conversation in that you're all very forthcoming. You're very, like, you're very articulate about the things that you feel are not right mm -hmm. and I think like we don't have those kinds of reporters in this room today but like in another room like if we had had this conversation there would have been headlines tomorrow about like difficult women um because angry women difficult women and I think Marty you said something about like being called difficult like can be a career ending thing I'm misquoting you but generally getting yeah. <laughs> the gist of it um and I'm just curious, like, how you think about, like, how do you respond to people who call you difficult? Because the bar is so low for being called that and being treated that way and being seen as an impediment. Like, how do you address that? Especially because so often there is a power imbalance, like, between the person who's calling you difficult and yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I typically try to do it with humor and kindness. I don't really, if someone calls me difficult, I don't counter them with being even more difficult, especially a man because it becomes a pissing contest and I don't have a penis and so I can't <laughs> pee as far as they can. And <laughs> I, I also find that I'm not going to give them any more ammo to find reasons. They've already made up their mind that I'm difficult just by the fact that I'm speaking and I'm using fairly large words. So they're, they've already made up their mind. I, I, unfortunately, I have learned to use different tactics in order to get their attention. And unfortunately, I've used different tactics just in order to get um, people to, to 
simmer their egos down so they don't just see me through the lens of being difficult. And I find as a woman, um, humor goes a long way, um, especially with another man. First, it, it's incredibly insulting because first they find it surprising that you're funny. They think it was a joke. They're like, did you just make a funny? Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> oh and then you make another one and then they get really <laughs> excited. You make a lot of funnies. And, um, but I find it's disarming. Um, and so if you can disarm someone before anger and ego and aggression take over, uh, the conversation, you're, you're able to be heard. And then through kindness, I can still stand up for myself and be difficult and strong, but I can be kind. And I don't think it's just a Canadian thing. I, I, think that all, <laughs> I don't. I think that all women, we, we just have had to learn and go through life being kind. Um, and kind isn't weak at all. This is a huge thing that I've learned as I've grown up. Being kind is incredibly more difficult than popping off and being a bitch. Um, and so I use kindness and humor really to sort of calm the situation and then I go in for the one-two punch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I am a bit difficult and I am bossy and I'm all right with that. And I think that, like, I agree with you that there is a way of handling it with being humor and always being polite. There's never a reason to be rude. As soon as you're rude, as soon as you use bad language in a situational confrontation, it shows that you have lost control. Mm -hmm. You've lost control of, your, like, of yourself, of your mind. You're, you've let your emotions overrun. But I, I am difficult and I don't mind if people find me intimidating and I don't mind. I'm never rude, I'm never mean, I've never been unkind to anyone in my entire life and I can sit here and be sure of that. But I am going to ask for what I want. I am going to ask for what I deserve. And when a man does it, he's celebrated and he's a leader. And that's what I want. And I'm going to keep going until I can take that and have that as a badge of honor rather than like a fucking letter that I've sewn onto my dress as like a D for difficult woman. Um, and I think it's important to 100% be, be aware of the way that you speak to people, but do not be afraid of being difficult. Do not be afraid of being a leader. Do not be afraid of of standing up for yourself. I think mm. that's very, very important. And don't be afraid of your reputation. As long as you're never actually on the wrong side of morality, don't be so worried about what other people think about you. And I, and I am a newcomer in Hollywood, and I, I'm not just saying this from a great position of power, and may, maybe I'll be like homeless in 10 years after having said all of these things, because no one will hire me again. <laughs> well, I hope not. I just think that as long as it's within Morality, I think it's very important to not be afraid of being a little bit hard to deal with if you're coming up against unfair resistance. What about you? I mean, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a combination of the two, I think, for me, um, is uh, I've been far too afraid that I didn't have value. I really bought into that idea. Um, you know, I really bought in. I mean, half my work's about it. Like, you know, I'm, I had terrible eating disorder growing up and, um, you know, and really have sort of fought and have mental health issues that I've battled my way back from more than once. And um, so having all these challenges, I really, I really thought there was something profoundly wrong with me. Now I understand that the fact that I survived those things means I'm pretty tough. But for years, I, I thought, oh, that means that I'm, I'm, there's something really, really wrong with me. And now I don't feel that way. But because of that, I think I took so much more shit than I needed to. I really didn't understand that my work had value and that my, what I brought to the table. On the other hand, I do really understand it's a business and yes. money talks. I cannot emphasize this enough, at least in my experience, which is if you're making the money, they will put up with a lot. Mm -hmm. But if you are not making the money, it doesn't matter what gender you are, what color you are, what sexual orientation you are, you're they'll find a way to get you out. Like it's a very um, ruthless, there's a ruthless quality to corporate, to the corporate world. And, um, and they'll find if, if, if it looks bad to fire you for something that is actionable, they'll lay in wait until they can, <laughs> or they'll, mar they'll margin marginalize you. Um, but to me, it's less about like gender issues and much more about power and money. Um, so I try to be really mindful about when I am difficult. And sometimes lately, I've also got enough, like n this next season, there'll be four shows on the air that I either created or co-created, you know? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, and now I have dollar power. 
Mm-hmm. So now... I'm going to hire all the women. I'm going to hire. I do too. That's the other thing is I really have and do. um, And I try to recognize in myself when I'm feeling threatened by other women because it it is kind of a, uh, it it isn't, I'm not going to get into why I think that may be true, but I, I, I think that it is something that can be very primal feeling, a very primal instinct of like there's not enough the, you know, the fucking saber tooth is tr- dragging my baby around. I got I to gotta get me a man, you know? <laughs> um, and when you feel that, when I feel those feelings, I really try to check where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. And, and Be self-aware. But I so agree with you. People are so afraid of confrontation. It is a secret superpower to be able to go in and directly and clearly and politely say, this isn't okay with me. Yes. Also, I have, can I add something yeah. to what you were saying? Yeah. Is that part of... I, and I know I've brought this up already, but it is something I'm vaguely obsessed with. Um, <laughs> part of making yourselves good enough to get the money that creates the power means also spending enough time on your craft yes. and on your skill set and on your brain and remembering that we are constantly being sold to because we are constantly having our confidence broken so that we will be consumers, right? We are constantly told to think about our bodies and our hair and getting like our manicures and this, that and the other, all this shit that men never have to think about, which means that women I know, most women I know, wake up an hour earlier than men to get ready. Actresses get into work an hour before men to have hair and makeup because we need so much done to like cover <laughs> our disgusting old faces. Um, and uh, and uh, we are always being distracted online and, and we're always being given all these messages from magazines about what we look like, what we look like, what we look like, what we look like, how old are we, how fat do we, are like this, that, and the other, all these different things that we're told to concentrate on. And every minute that you spend thinking about how thin and gorgeous and young you aren't is a minute that you are not spending thinking about school, thinking about growing your business, growing your happiness, growing your health, your mental health. So try as much as you can, as I said before about the removing the detox, the, the remo- detoxing yourself from all the, the bullshit that's out there. Make sure that you recognize how much time you're spending a day. You know, they, I wish they had an app for it. You know, like they have an app for how much time you spend on social That's media. A great idea. I fucking wish they had an app for how much time <laughs> we spend thinking about our exterior, <laughs> which doesn't matter that men yeah. spend so little time thinking about whatsoever because they're just going for... The, the goal, that's it. Their eyes are just on the prize and that's all they're focusing on. <laughs> Think about it, register in it, write it down on notes every time you have a bad thought about yourself or just a thought about your looks and think about how much time you're putting into building up you in totality. I started a, a movement on Instagram called, uh, it's like at I underscore way and what it's about is women no longer being valued for how little we weigh. For our exterior, it's about recognizing yourself in your totality for all the parts of your life that are brilliant. The children, the family, the work, the school, the everything. Everything that makes up who you are. We have been devalued and diminished so much by society as to not being worth anything more than that. And I think that via the thing that I've started on Instagram, which is kind of like one safe space on the internet where you can see other women starting to remember that, oh no, wait, I cure cancer for a living. Oh, I'm a, I save lives. Oh, I'm a firefighter. Or I survived cancer. Or I survived. Or I'm living with a, a tremendous disability. People who are actually remembering that are like, oh, yeah. wow, it doesn't matter that I'm not built like a cola bottle. Like, I'm an amazing person. I'm a woman. I'm a human being. Please take that sentiment with you. And remember that there are so many pieces to what makes up all of the women that sit here today, you are so much more than what we just see at the first glance. And you have to recognize that, build that up, and stop thinking about all of the nonsense that we are told that we have to think about. That's all. Yeah. Um, So we're running out of time. I want to make sure we have a couple of minutes for questions from you guys. I think we can probably take two. So managing (laughs) expectations here. Sure. Sorry, I unbuttoned my pants, so it's getting comfortable. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Michelle Williams thing. Wasn't the agent, didn't they both fall under the same agency? Yes. Yeah. So do you know anything about what happened with that agent or if a conversation (laughs) came from Uh that? 
I, I don't, I don't personally, um, a, a huge conversation came from it. Yeah. And you but to the agent. Yeah. And, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, tell me. A public apology. I mean, I'm not the reporter. I feel like I okay. am. <laughs> so, um, a, a public apology was given, I, I think. Um, I do know that then the agency also kicked in some money towards uh, Mark. Um, a tremendous amount of money. A tremendous like, amount yeah. of money. Uh, Mark Wahlberg towards, I think, the same, the same fund that Mark Wahlberg yeah. gave his salary to. So there was definitely an, a, an admission of guilt and it acknowledgement. Seems like, it seemed like the issue was more about Mark Wahlberg and Michelle Williams when it kind of should have been more about the agent. People the agency was where I was going with that. Like, yes. that's where the conversation needs to be I would think but well I think it you. was a, a quick and dirty again I don't know anything and I don't want if anyone works at the agency or is the agency don't come <laughs> to my house I don't know you uh, but, I just bought a house. <laughs> yeah don't come get me in Canada I have nothing to do with you we can but, all go to the we can all go yeah. to camping together if we all get fired up yeah okay good, yeah good. let's good. totally go camping but I, I I I agree with you I think that I I kept being so frustrated because, it, I mean, it was a lovely gesture that Mark Wahlberg made. I think it was incredible, uh, great for him, but dude, that's exactly what you should have done. Um, uh, but I do think it came, again, the story and the way the story was shaped and then the way the story was told that this man was given all of this money and he was a hero because he just sprinkled it around at all of the other <laughs> women that didn't get the money. So I agree with you, it was shaped by the media in a really unsavory way. Um, I would have liked to have known more about the agency, but their, quick, their, their very quick movement to sort of remedy and just sweep it under the carpet shows, I think, a complete admission of guilt. Um, I know that there's been a lot of agreements between a lot of agencies for uh, gender parity soon. I think they've given a date of like 2022, so thanks for trying in five years. But um, <laughs> I, I do think that it did put pressure on the agency and it's put pressures on a lot of agencies yeah, to uh, know that they're, they are accountable for these kind of actions and they're going to be in the public eye. So I do think it put fear in them, but you're right, I wish this story had been, there had been a, a different villain in the story. Welcome. One more. Hello, I'm over Hi. Here. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, first of all, you're all amazing. I've loved this conversation. Um, I just wanted to ask, what would be the one thing, if there was one thing that we could take home with us and plug into our lives to inspire us, motivate us, whatever it may be, what would be the one thing you'd want us to take away from today? Make a list every single day. I do this every morning and every night when I'm feeling down of every single thing that is good about you and your life. Mm -hmm. And I know this sounds really cheesy, and I don't care because it really works for me. And it's so amazing how many times a day I forget and I lose perspective mm -hmm. because of the chaos that is around us everywhere. And now we have our phones and it's, just, it's everywhere. It's all over our brains. We're just drenched in like shame and guilt and worry. Uh, make that list every day and every night until you start to remember naturally that you are a rounded individual who's made up of lo loads of parts and you are worthy of great things and lots of love and respect. Okay. That's my one bit of thing that I would like to do to get rid of that. That's um, my one bit of thing, what great English. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I mean, to me, my one thing is that, well, it's a two-part one thing, it's, I'll be real quick. Um, one, that Rome wasn't built in a day, so uh, failing is part of succeeding. Uh, I failed, I fail, I, I failed on the way here. I fail all the time, but um, that is part of growing as, a, as a, a businesswoman and as an entrepreneur or a business person. The other one is what you're doing matters. Every single product, story, they're all narratives. And everything you make and put into the world changes the story. And everything you do that is positive or makes people feel empowered changes the story. So every step you guys are taking is going to make this world a more fair, more equitable, more reasonable place. So don't ever think it doesn't matter. People will try to tell you what you're doing because it's pretty or it's superfluous or it, it matters because you're telling your story. Keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I touched on mine before, go out of your way to uplift one woman every day. Yeah. It will really change. <laughs> 
it'll change your intention and how you go through the day and you'll see a, visceral, you'll see a response from her and it really does reverberate between, b through all womankind when women are kind to each other and good to each other and it's contagious. You're going to tell me like I look cute and it's going to make me feel good. I put a pep in my step and I'm going to go and tell <laughs> three other people they look cute and we're all cute and you're good and you're smart and it really, it does, it encourages celebrating each other instead of like competing against each other and wanting to beat each other and uh, it, it, it also, um, I think it's really important to do it to young women to teach them how to be good to each other because their only examples right now are those examples on Instagram, something that rhymes with Kardashian, so <laughs> Car Kardashian, yeah, Car Kardashian, um, which are lovely women. <laughs> But um, instead of trying to ha and having, thinking that they have to, to be like that and look like that and act like that, just complimenting who they are in their own little bodies, and then they'll start to learn how to do that. It's really go through your, go through your day with the intention of uplifting a woman. And, and, and their minds and their personalities and their sense of humor, it's like all of the things, like just because that is the problem with social media is that it's all just the exterior that we end up complimenting about each other. And don't be afraid to be smart and to be funny in front of men. Don't. Like sometimes men are threatened by smart or funny women and we try to make ourselves small and harmless. Don't carry that fear around with you. Find a man who is man enough <laughs> to handle that and respect that and love that about you. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Marty, Jamila, Amanda, thank you so thank much. You guys. Thank you guys. Such an amazing conversation.